Members have been given notice by not less than 30 members. Understanding Order 11, I have summoned the Assembly to meet today for the purpose of debating a motion on support for the rule of law. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly notes with concern the violence on our streets over recent days and condemns without equivocation those involved, sends best wishes to those police officers attacked or injured whilst protecting the community, and extends its sympathy to those members of the public who have suffered distress, loss or damage as a result, reaffirms its full commitment to support for policing and for the rule of law, recognises that leadership comes with responsibility, recommits to upholding a culture of lawfulness in both actions and in words, and calls for an immediate and complete end to this violence. And I call Naomi Long to move the motion. Moved, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. You will have ten minutes to, um, to propose the motion and ten minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. And I now call on Naomi Long to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it is with a heavy heart that I rise to propose the motion for debate today. I thought long and hard before deciding to uh, submit a recall petition. However, in the face of successive nights of violence and unrest on our streets, I felt it would be a dereliction of our duty as an Assembly not to return and address this issue in a democratic forum and seek to calm tensions and jointly call for this to end. Over 55 police officers have been injured in over 36 incidents of disorder, deliberately designed to draw the police into areas to be attacked as they try to protect the community. The scenes we have witnessed of people forced from their cars, Bus drivers and passengers ordered off public transport and vehicle satellite are nothing short of disgraceful. Anyone who in any way tries to justify, excuse or deflect from those abhorrent scenes should also be thoroughly ashamed. I want to place on the record my support for those officers, for their families and for the police service in general, for all the work they are doing day by day, night by night to keep people safe. I wish those injured a swift and complete recovery from what could be life-changing injuries. My thoughts, too, are with ordinary members of the public going about their day only to have their lives disrupted and property destroyed by mindless thugs. It is a mercy that no one has lost their life as a result of this appalling violence, and I would appeal again for everyone with influence in our community to use it to end this. The scenes over the last week have been as depressing as they are disgraceful. Whilst not all of those involved are young, it has been particularly disturbing to see another generation of young people, of children, some as young as 12 or 13, involved in violent confrontation with the police. However, my horror at that has been intensified as I watched adults old enough to be their parents, old enough to know better, standing by cheering and goading and encouraging young people on as they wreaked havoc in their own community. This is nothing short of child abuse. There are many theories as to why this violence has erupted, and whilst there may be an element of truth in each of them, there is and can be no excuse or justification for what has taken place. Our condemnation of such violence must be unequivocal. We have all been aware of the simmering tensions in parts of our community over the outworkings of Brexit for some months. Most of us, including those who oppose Brexit, have some sympathy for those people out there who feel betrayed. They were promised some sunlit uplands, but that was a fantasy. It was never how Brexit would end. Those in government knew that, but were more interested in their own ascent to power than the hurt and instability their deception would cause here in Northern Ireland. Instead of calm and measured leadership in the face of challenge, we have instead heard inflammatory rhetoric with threats of renewed violence bandied around by people who claim to be trying to lead others away from their violent past. That dangerous language, that foolish talk, could only ever serve to further stoke the anger. While people will claim they were speaking in metaphors, we know all too well that many others hear it literally. Temperatures were raised still further last week. After a year of restrictions and lockdowns, people were understandably frustrated and even angry that those who made the rules and then broke the rules may not be held to account. Because upholding a culture of lawfulness is not only about what we say, it is also about what we do. Leadership leadership is about action, not just words. However, a few of those teenagers burning buses and throwing masonry will have been influenced by the finer points of the Northern Ireland Protocol or COVID regulations.
I hate the phrase recreational riding because it trivialises something which causes untold harm. But many of them are bored, angry, reckless, willing to engage in high-risk behaviour for thrills and excitement. Few of them are considering the impact that a bad decision today will have on the rest of their lives. Some of them are convinced they have no real future worth worrying about. It is utterly tragic. Some of those young people are also vulnerable to coercive control from the same gangsters who pollute their community with drugs and are engaged in extortion, racketeering and thuggery. Those malignant influences have every reason to seek to undermine police engagement with the community, given the recent successes of the paramilitary and organised crime task force in disrupting their criminal activities and their incomes. The evidence of orchestration in some areas is confirmation of that. And last night, as the trouble moved towards interfaces and flashpoints in our city, with a depressing inevitability, it became clear that deep-rooted sectarian hatred still propels people towards violence. All of those factors and more may have played a part in creating the toxic environment in which trouble has erupted. But while there are many factors that have contributed to the febrile atmosphere, there can be no excuses or justifications. And there is a common thread throughout. Lack of leadership and a common target, the police service of Northern Ireland. Those who intentionally or unintentionally through their actions or their words, have helped to position policing as a lightning conductor for anger and frustration in the community, now need to step back and reflect. We need to dial down the rhetoric, walk back the ultimatums and allow the accountability and oversight structures for policing and justice to do their job. It is time to support the police, both on the ground and their leadership, as they do their jobs. I therefore welcome the unanimous statement issued by the Northern Ireland Policing Board yesterday and trust that alongside this support for motion, the motion today, it marks a start to rebuilding trust, relationships and respect. Because there are political solutions to all of the issues I have raised. We are not powerless and if we work together we can shape things for the better. We can work with business, government and the European Union to resolve the challenges around operation of the protocol and focus on achievable solutions, such as a full veterinary agreement to mitigate the worst impacts and de-escalate both the disruption and the tensions. We can ensure that in all we say and do, we acknowledge the challenge and sacrifice that lockdown has been for all of our people and provide leadership in terms of both respecting the regulations and guidance and also collectively working to deliver an inclusive recovery. We can work together to tackle deprivation and exclusion, particularly among our young people, that leaves them vulnerable to paramilitary influence. We can invest to build more resilient communities that can resist coercive control from thugs and gangsters. That work is already underway through the Tackling Paramilitarism programme, and with focused and sustained investment, it has the power to transform people's lives. And we can confront the sectarianism in our society and take action to tackle it through support for integrated education, shared housing and diverse communities. We cannot rewrite the past, but we can agree to start a new chapter, one that offers hope in this community. But all of that needs to be built on a firm foundation, respect for the rule of law and respect for policing and justice. The system of checks and balances are designed to ensure that the operational elements of justice are independent and free of political interference. We may not agree with every operational decision of the police, the public prosecution service or the judiciary. But it is absolutely vital that if and when we have concerns, they are directed through the correct channels and due process is respected. Community confidence in policing is not ours to give or to take away. Neither is it the job of the police alone to build it. Each of us have a duty to build that confidence by our actions and our words, by our active and visible support for and engagement with the police at every level. The Policing Board has unanimously asked that we will invite HMIC to assess the policing of the Story Funeral against national standards, and they will report in a matter of weeks. In the meantime, it is not for me or anyone else to prejudge the outcome. None of us have the expertise in policing or full knowledge of the facts, and it is profoundly unfair and incredibly damaging to trash the reputation of the police service and senior officers without evidence. 
We must allow those tasked with the complex challenge of policing this community to do that job without fear or favour. Our actions today will impact on our ability to deliver fair and effective policing right across our community, both now and for the future. Mr Speaker, I propose this motion in the genuine hope that despite our different perspectives, we can unite in support for policing, for the rule of law, for delivering political solutions to the challenges that we face, and above all, in our desire to seek an immediate end to this violence before the damage done is irreparable. Thank you. Uh, can we bring uh, Arnie Foster on screen, please? And can I now invite Arlene Foster to contribute to this debate? Thank you. Ron Silent, Ms. Foster. Can you hear me now, Mr. Speaker? Yes, certainly. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I uh, apologise for that, Mr. Speaker, and can I apologise also for my voice today, and I hope that people can uh, at least make some of what I'm saying out. I do welcome this motion uh, brought to the House today. Um, the scenes we have seen over this last evening and in previous evenings in various parts of Northern Ireland are, are totally unacceptable. There can be no place in our society for violence or the threat of violence, and it must stop. Just as it was wrong in the past and was never justified, so it is wrong now and cannot be justified. The injury to frontline officers, victims terrorised, damage to people's property, the harm to Northern Ireland's image in this our centenary year has taken us backwards. And no brick, no bottle, no petrol bomb thrown has achieved or can ever achieve anything but destruction, harm and fear. We are indebted to the police officers who stand between order and those who prefer anarchy. We are also indebted to all those political representatives, community leaders, parents, pastors and others who have sought to calm tension and urge restraint. Rioting, criminality and wanton destruction destroys lives, livelihoods and brings fear and misery to local communities. It is not in the name of the people who live in the areas impacted, and I have spoken to some of those people, and it's certainly not in their name. Today is not the time to rehearse the arguments of this last number of weeks. Safe to say that we should all know well that when politics fail or are perceived to be failing in Northern Ireland, then those who fill the vacuum offer destruction and despair. We cannot allow a new generation of our young people to fall victim to that path or be preyed upon by some who prefer the shadows to the light. So political problems require political solutions, never street violence. Northern Ireland is faced with a number of deep and significant political challenges in the time ahead. And collectively, we must work through those challenges because responsible leadership will not cherry pick the problems that are easiest Responsible leadership uh, means actively listening to views that people may not uh, agree with or want to hear. Responsible leadership will not deny the existence of the most political difficult challenges or wish them away. And responsible leadership will not leave things to fester or to worsen. And in this assembly, our democratic forum, we will always have our differences. We will always have our different legitimate expectations. But the only bedrock on which we can move forward successfully is to recommit ourselves to redouble our efforts to solve each and every one of the challenges we face through politics. A stable and prosperous Northern Ireland requires a solution to all of our challenges, built on the firm foundation that every citizen is equal under the law and equally subject to the law, regardless of background or status. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Michelle O'Neill. Gormi, I've got a can call you. And can I um, also welcome the opportunity to, to speak in today's debate, albeit saddened by the fact that we're actually even having to have this debate. I think it's incumbent upon us all as Assembly members, as political leaders, uh, to meet and to publicly express our deep concerns relating to the recent violence and the ongoing street disorder 
um, over Easter week, um, right across many areas, Belfast, Derry, Tyrone, and other parts of the north. What we saw uh, last night at Lanark Way interface, I think, was a very dangerous escalation of events of recent days, and it's utterly deplorable. This morning, I met with the Chief Constable, Simon Byrne, who also then briefed the special meeting of the Executive, where he gave an operational update on the police response. And as we speak uh, here today, 55 police officers have been injured, and I want to start my remarks by sending solidarity to those officers, to their families at this um, very difficult time. And also, I think that you know, at a time when they are out on the front face of this, tackling very difficult situations on the ground, trying to protect people and our communities from harm, protecting property. Can I also start by again reaffirming support for the rule of law and to those who are charged with upholding it on our streets? Um, I am glad to say to this, executive, that to this assembly that the executive just met this morning, and uh, we also have the chief constable there, as I've said. And as a result of that engagement, we have now issued a joint executive statement. I think it's really, really important at this time. Our, wor our words are very powerful, and I think it's really, really important at this time that the executive has sent out that united front. There is an, an onus on every single MLA and other public representatives to assume our responsibilities to address the tensions as we see them, to restore calm and to work with those credible local community leaders and the police to provide leadership requ that is required to confront these problems. As political leaders, we must stand united in appealing to all concerned to refrain from further threats or use of violence and recognise that it is only through democratic politics that we can solve our problems and concerns and call on those together call on those organising young people to engage in violence to stop, and to those young people themselves to call on them to exercise restraint. Nobody could fail to be alarmed by the fact that these are young people, children as young as 13, barely a teenager, that are involved in rioting, both at Sandy Row and then last night again similar scenes at Lanark Way. It's not right, it's dangerous, it's unacceptable. And it is a miracle that, as we stand here today, that no one has been killed. I want to commend all those that are on the ground, working really hard within their communities, trying to provide diversionary activities for children and young people, because we know that that can help to prevent further antisocial behaviour for those, for those whom face the highest risk of influence. And we all know where that influence is coming from. It is coming from illegal, loyalist paramilitaries and criminal elements that are orchestrating this violence. Will they stand back and send youngsters out to do their bidding? These people are no role models for our youth. They are outdated, they are antiquated, and they are caught in a time warp, which has no bearing on where the vast majority of people across the society now are, or indeed where they want to be. They are holding back their own people, and they are holding back their own community. It is only through dialogue, through democratic institutions, where political solutions to problems can be found. This Saturday marks the 23rd anniversary of the signing of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. It created these democratic institutions based on power sharing and guaranteed equality and parity of esteem between both traditions and the right for citizens to be Irish, to be British or to be both. It also created an alternative to conflict. It gave today's generation the precious gift of peace and of hope. It is vital that the benefits of the peace process are safeguarded and built upon for future generations, and that all of our people feel the benefit. The LCC, we are told, have now withdrawn their support for this agreement. What is their logic? And more importantly, what is their alternative? Unionist leaders have withdrawn their support for the Chief Constable, demanding that he resign. So whenever we see this manifest with young people from working class loyalist areas attacking the police, it seems to me, and all who are watching on, that these things can't be entirely divorced. Surely, unequivocal support for the police and its leadership is the responsible thing to guarantee, to, to guarantee from this Democratic Assembly today. Political unionism champion Brexit dragged out. Uh, can, call you, um, can I just say that I think that what we need to do is focus together as an executive, as an assembly, as political leaders to work together to say, and to say very clearly that there is room for everybody at the table, but I tell you where there isn't room. 
There isn't room for armed gangs. There isn't room for criminal gangs who care nothing about the future of this society. It's incumbent upon us as political leaders whom which the public give their support to work together. Those people are enemies of the peace, and it's our job to make sure that all generations and future generations feel the benefit of the peace. Gormagat. Gormagat, thank you. And I call Nicola Mullen. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support this motion and speak on behalf of the SDLP. And I want to begin, as others have, by addressing the escalation in violence which took place in Belfast last night. When I became Infrastructure Minister last year, I never imagined that I would be receiving updates about the condition of one of our bus drivers, a public servant, after a bus was hijacked and petrol bombed while the attackers were cheered on by a mob. Last night, a bus driver was attacked doing his job serving the community. A press photographer was attacked for doing his job in capturing the truth. Police officers were, for the eighth consecutive night, attacked for doing their job, protecting communities and keeping us safe. If anyone needed a wake-up call to the dangerous escalation of this situation, they should reflect on these facts. And it has to be said that the immediate response on social media from some political leaders fell far short of what was needed to provide assurances to people and communities who are afraid of where we go next. Mr Speaker, today is not the day for the political blame game. The people of Northern Ireland aren't stupid. They know how we got to this dreadful point and they know why. What the people of Northern Ireland want to know is what are we, as their political leaders, going to do to de-escalate the situation and prevent it from reoccurring and infecting another generation of disadvantaged young people. I appeal to all members of this House to reflect seriously on where their words are taking us over the course of the next few hours and the next few days. The truth is that the violence and disorder, the sustained attacks on police officers, is a damning indictment of the quality of political leadership that has been provided to our communities. The fact that children are engaged in violence on our streets is a damning indictment of the quality of political leadership that has been provided to our communities. These are young people who should be looking with excitement to their future and their careers. They should have the world at their feet. Instead, they are looking at criminal convictions that will follow them throughout their lives and limit their ambitions and opportunities. Is that the kind of society that we want to be responsible for? After years of lost opportunities and lost lives, are we content to sacrifice another generation to our own divisions? I welcome the voices here today who have condemned the violence of recent days. But the truth is, we have condemned working class communities to this cycle of violence for generations. I look at those young people in Carrick Fergus and Newton Abbey, and I see the burden of poverty, isolation and alienation that they share with young people in the New Lodge and in Ardoin. This place these institutions should have been an example to people everywhere of what we can achieve by living for ideals rather than fighting for them. Instead of building partnerships, we have allowed division to occupy the heart of our institutions. It has affected and infected our politics and our communities. And most unforgivably, it has placed a limit on the scale of our young people's ambition. I, I will. To my colleague for giving way, would she agree with me that one of the most damaging and upsetting things about what's happening is that we're allowing young people to be infected with the narrative of win versus loss, of zero sum, of one community being pitted against another, and we need to overcome that. This cannot be a zero sum society. It has to be shared. Member has an additional minute. I absolutely agree with the member, and we should all reflect on the sad reality of the commonality that many of our citizens have. As we stand here today, 120,000 children are living in poverty. 40,000 families are waiting for a home that meets their needs. Thousands are waiting for urgent medical care. The children wearing balaclavas on our streets this week were born into a society, none of their own making, an unequal society where they start off at a disadvantage and they are looking to us for help. So what we offer here today and in the weeks ahead needs to be more than judgment or criminal sanction. I regret that some in this House followed the raging crowd rather than providing direction over the last few months. As leaders, we have an obligation to exercise our influence to reduce tensions and bring this violence to an end. 
The message that we all need to send today is one of unequivocal condemnation of those who are orchestrating this violence and pushing children and young people into harm's way. Rather than continue to fail these young people, leaving them ripe for manipulation and exploitation, we need to be unequivocal in our commitment to tackle the poverty, the alienation and hopelessness faced by so many of our young people and so many of our citizens and working class communities. When Lyra McCree was brutally murdered, we all stood together and said, never again. We must all unite to act on that pledge. John Hume once said, if the underlying problem hasn't changed, the underlying solution hasn't changed. We have a duty and an obligation to work together to address the problems that plague our communities. And I assure the people of Northern Ireland that the SDLP remains committed to playing our part. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, and I now call Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I indeed thank uh, the uh, Justice Minister for bringing this motion before the Assembly today. Uh, members of this Assembly, violence on the street or anywhere is completely unacceptable. Organised criminal gangs bringing out children, young people, and others to commit act acts of wanton destruction helps no one and no cause. The imagery this portrays of 21st century Northern Ireland into our second century is not something that anybody should want to see. This violence must stop before anyone is killed. COVID hasn't gone away. Creating chaos and disruption not only damages Northern Ireland, it is also creating opportunities for the transmission of the disease. And it's not only in the violence breaking the law, it is also breaching the health regulations. That indeed is the very reason that we have complained so vehemently about all those who have undermined the health regulations so far. And it's in that breaching of those regulations that puts all of our people at risk, as much as the violence is putting people at risk. I say as well that burning of cars and roundabouts in Clock Fern, very close to my constituency, just in sight of where we are setting up a Nightingale recovery facility at the White Abbey Hospital is beyond worse. I also want to re-emphasise our full support for the PSNI. Attacks on any of our police who are on the front line of defending us against terrorism and help deliver our public safety during this pandemic is beholden of all politicians to support the police as they continue to do the most difficult of tasks, and they deserve our unreserved thanks. On behalf of our party, can I re-emphasise as well our abhorrence of attacks on the police and wish all of those 55 injured a swift recovery. And we also trust that those who have injured and attacked the police and committed criminal acts are brought swiftly to justice. And we will be continuing to pass on our support and our discussions with the Chief Constable we will be having with them this afternoon. I would also like to comment on remarks I made last week about Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. I wish to make clear that we fully support the HMIC and its work, and that its professionalism and its ability to investigate impartially is without, is without any doubt. And we look forward to the publication of its findings on the policing of the Bobby Story funeral as soon as they are available. Mr Speaker, the violence and destruction across Northern Ireland is unacceptable and unjustifiable. If it does not halt now, the risk of someone being seriously injured or killed is there. Any anger that there, it must be directed through political, diplomatic and legal channels. To use violence is to lose the argument and to inflict great damage not only on your cause, but also to your community, for those are the ones who are left to pick up the pieces. I welcome, as indeed does our party, the joint statement from the Royal Nine Executive today, and that is indeed as a start. And I must say to the First Minister and the Deputy First Ministers, the other members of the Executive, I think that is an important move to where we need to get to as well. But all of us politicians must be standing shoulder to shoulder to make sure we have our best endeavours across all of Northern Ireland to make politics work. Violence and the threat of violence has no place in any society. In particular, it has no place in Northern Ireland. Together, we must work together to stop this happening. Mr Speaker, we support the motion. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm proud to have come from the New Buildings area of London Dairy, and my wife is from Nelson Drive. I've been born and bred in the community. My roots are there, and it's the greatest honour that I have to have a mandate to represent those areas and all the people of the Foyle constituency. The images and the videos that I have seen on the news outlets are not a true reflection of who we are. In my constituency, I believe that the sense of community and looking out for one another is second to none. Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen the best of our people stepping up to help their neighbours. I unequivocally condemn the violence and the disorder that we have witnessed across our communities in recent days. Whether the violence happens in London Derry or Belfast, Ballymena or Craigavon, it should be condemned equally. I will indeed. I'm very grateful uh, to my colleague for giving way. My colleague will be aware that on social media there are currently uh, postings being put up trying to entice people into further law-breaking. Would my friend join with me in urging especially young people to ignore those voices that would take them down a path that would destroy their lives? The member has an extra minute. I, I thank the member for that, and I, I, I do indeed agree with that. Uh, there can be no excuse for damaging or destroying the property of our neighbours within our communities, or indeed attacking the PSNI officers attending the scene. My thoughts are with each and every one of those officers injured, and indeed all of the rank and file officers of PSNI who have unacceptably come under attack for simply doing their job. There is no doubt that there are deep frustrations and anger within the unionist loyalist community. However, the presence of this disorder and rioting on our streets is wholly unacceptable. There is no justification. The fundamental concerns expressed by the wider unionist community are genuine and they must be addressed. It is of the utmost importance that these concerns are not drowned out by the, the destruction and the mayhem that we have sadly witnessed on our streets. The outworking of that frustration and anger must be entirely peaceful and democratic. The overwhelming majority of my constituents, and no doubt constituents across Northern Ireland, are law-abiding uh, and they, they just want their concerns heard. We must never, ever stoop to the levels of those who would use terror and violence for political means. Frustrations have been building for months. Speech after speech in this chamber, I, I and others warned of the complete disregard being shown to the unionist community by those who championed at the border in the ABC and called for the rigorous, rigorous implementation of the protocol. The complete disregard for the COVID-19 uh, re regulations by the Deputy First Minister has caused immense anger and se raised serious concerns about the criminal justice system. In the same week that the Deputy First Minister and her colleagues received word that they would face no prosecutions for breaching the COVID restrictions, at least 12 loyalists that I am aware of in Londonderry have been summoned to court for a legal assembly. The incident that I refer to didn't happen last week or last year or the year before that. It happened four years ago. Four years ago, a group of loyalists gathered peacefully to tackle issues that were uh, ongoing in the Collins Park area and Bond Street area, antisocial behaviour. Night after night, there was violence, alcohol and drug abuse in that park. There were no summonses for those engaging in that behaviour. Yet four years on, the week that, that the Deputy First Minister and others got off the hook, the, the, the Loyalists have received these summonses. So there's, there's questions to be asked uh, by the PPS in that respect. The perception of two-tiered policing has led to the erosion of support within the unionist community and created a vacuum which, sadly, others seek to fill. Where there is a perception or a reality of double, double standard by the police, then that damages respect for the rule of law. When those in senior government positions break the law but are not held accountable, then that endangers devolution. It is because we believe in the police and we believe in the rule of law that we want to see it applied equally and fairly. Everyone in this chamber and outside of this chamber must work to re rebuild confidence and promote stability. Given the scale of the problem facing trust in politics and policing, while we support today's motion, it is self-evident that words of condemnation will never be enough to provide solutions. We all have choices to make. We have a choice as to whether to engage in violence or not. We have a choice as to, uh, as to what path we take in life. It's our job in this chamber to improve the choices that our young people have, to provide them with a hopeful present reality, a hopeful future, and not to be reenacting the acts which sadly we have seen too familiar in the past. We as an assembly need to focus on the full reopening of our youth services, allowing for intervention and targeted programs for our young people, providing them with an alternative path 
that highlight that they have a voice, that they're going to be heard, and that they have a say in the democratic processes, and never again to turn to the violent acts which we all agree are completely and totally wrong. All of us in this chamber need to redouble our efforts to bring about calm and hope for all in Northern Ireland. Therefore, I ask of this chamber, do you care deeply enough about a shared future to take on board the genuine concerns raised by the unionist community? Collectively, we have the ability in this chamber to send out a strong message to each and every person within our society, a message that we are serious about making Northern Ireland work. We want to deliver a better future and that we're not going back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Martin Anderson. Going may I can call you. The violence that erupted in Derry was mainly in the waterside PUL areas, and it was orchestrated by crime gangs. To demonstrate the unity of purpose, political leaders, myself, Gary Milton, Karen Mullen, and Sinead McLaughlin met with the PSNI District Commander, the Chamber of Commerce, the City Centre Initiative, and other statutory agencies to discuss reports of ambulances being stoned, petrol bombs being fired at cars, petrol bombs being put into the hands of 12 year old children, and police officers being injured, and afterwards we issued a joint statement calling for an end to the ongoing cycle of violence. I, along with Sinn Féin councillor Christopher Jackson, we were in small, mainly nationalist areas in the waterside, like Curry Nairn and Shepherd's Glen, with residents who felt utterly terrified in their own homes, as attempts were made to restrict access into and out of their estates, putting lives, families and communities at risk. There's no doubt that council and departmental support is needed for the besieged community of Curry Nairn, for youth services and to build community capacity. In national areas of Derry, when violence occurs, it's community activists, youth leaders in Sinn Féin, who are on the ground assisting to de-escalate situations and challenging bad, be bad behaviour. Today in this chamber, we need to demonstrate a generosity of spirit. We need to outreach to one another. We need to dial down the rhetoric. We need to build on the common ground upon which we all stand. And as political leaders, we need to recommit to upholding a culture of lawfulness in both action and in words. 23 years after the Good Friday Agreement, we are, thankfully, in the privileged space where dialogue can be used to build relationships between orange, green, and all other traditions who call our society home. As political representatives, leadership is essential at all times, in good times and in challenging times. The key to this is dialogue and proactive engagement between all traditions and none. We all know that our young people and people collectively deserve a society in which tolerance equal treatment and the rule of law are standards governing all institutions and everyday life. I have listened and I have heard people in the PUEL community who feel their identity has been undermined as a result of changes brought about by the British government and by political unionism. Those changes have happened and they challenge us but they have to be managed. So my appeal today in this chamber, on behalf of the many people in Derry that I have the privilege of representing, is for us to work together and to use dialogue to meet those challenges together and to shape a future that addresses the needs of all of our people together. I don't want to see any young person from any tradition having their lives ruined by a criminal record. Young people enraged by dangerous provocative rhetoric are easy prey 
for crime gangs involved in drug dealing, extortion and intimidation, as well as attacks on journalists, bus drivers, photographers and representatives. It will be those young loyalists who will face the raft of the criminal justice system, not those who shamefully stoked up and orchestrated such violence. Today, we must stand together to condemn without equivocation the violence on our streets, which serves as a sobering reminder that peace is a process that needs to be constantly safeguarded. If leadership is shown today and every day, and if the rhetoric is toned down, then inevitably close. the violence will be too. Tom McTacky, Les and Ruin. I support the motion. Thank you. Gary Middleton, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Foyle, Martina Anderson, uh, stated that ambulances were stoned. I think we need to be very careful with our facts and with our language in this chamber uh, around, around uh, comments such as that. Okay. Very briefly, please. It's, I, I says we were discussing reports of ambulances being stoned, so that's the difference. Okay, let's, let's not have a cross-chamber argument around reports and so on. And I call um, Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I declare an interest as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Mr. Speaker, no one could be but saddened and depressed at the scenes of violence and destruction on our streets in the last number of days. And let us be very clear, no ambiguity, no double talk, no smoke and mirrors. This is wrong. No one should use as a cover or take as license to be involved in attacking police officers, burning cars, buses, property, and instilling fear in their own community and in someone else's. Because of legitimate political concerns in relation to the events that have unfolded in our country over the last number of months. Whether that be the protocol, whether that be the circumstances surrounding the funeral of Bobby's story and how it was mishandled. Today is also a sad day for the family of two RUC officers murdered 44 years ago this day on Good Friday outside Money Moor. One of those officers was from my own hometown of Ballymoney. Constable John Thompson McCracken, along with Constable Kenneth Sheeran, 122, the other 19. One of the gunmen was to become a hunger striker. Those who are the heroes of those who represent Sinn Féin in this assembly. I ask today, are they, were, was the gunman a role model for our young people? I have heard eulogies in this house that stand in stark condemnation to the bravery of those two constables. So when we come to condemnation, let us not be partial. Let us not be selective. Violence was wrong in 1977, and violence is still wrong in 2021. But Mr. Speaker, that brings me to discuss an issue in terms of rhetoric and how important our words are, and our words are important. And we have been challenged as unionist leaders in regards to what we have said in recent days. But let me also say, as my colleague Gary Middleton has referred to, we have listened to a barrage of disrespect to the centenary of this country that is our home. The members opposite cannot even recognise and see as offensive the shape of Northern Ireland. 
I listened. I listened in this house a number of weeks ago to three contributions from Emma Sheeran, Martina Anderson, and also from Pat Sheehan. And if that is respect, then I think we have to rethink the definition of that word. But it's not only Sinn Féin. Let's remember that members of the SDLP have told us when concerns were raised in regards to their protocol, suck it up, it's not changing. Let's be clear that there has been on social media comments made by the leader of the SDLP and by an alliance MLA who have engaged in name calling a particular colleague of mine, an MP, and I wouldn't repeat in this chamber what he was called. So if we want to dial down the rhetoric. Yes. I see the members probably run out of time in relation to the speech, but he maybe could touch on some of the comments where Sinn Féin had threatened violence if there hadn't have been a border in the Irish Sea. John O'Dowd, point of order. I would ask that that comment is withdrawn, as there is no evidence whatsoever that Sinn Féin has threatened violence at any time. I just want to, before we continue on with the debate, and I did want to intervene in any shape or form today, and I think the debate has gone quite well, notwithstanding the subject of the debate. But uh, I do remind members that there is an awful lot of people out there watching and listening to what's going on in here this morning. They want to see leadership, constructive, positive, measured leadership, principal leadership from the members of this House across all the parties. So I don't want to hear any other kind of contributions which are straying into disrespect. And I would point out that two speakers in the past, Willie Hay and Mitch McLaughlin, actually brought a departure to the rulings of previous speakers insofar as they focus much more attentively on the conduct of the debate and the language used and the disrespect and the tone of the debate. And I think they were quite successful in their tenures of people cast their minds back, notwithstanding the difficult circumstances when they both presided over this House. So I want to return to our main members that use respectful language, make your points. People here are growing up, they're very mature politicians. They can use, you can make your arguments without insulting someone. You can make an argument without inflaming the mood out there. I listened, like every other elected like representative in this chamber, to the fears and the worries of people out in the communities last night in my own constituency, like all their members have testified here this morning, and all other members can do so. So I don't want to be hearing those people ringing tonight or tomorrow night or having the same fears as they had yesterday. Our job in here is to support this motion this morning, if that's what the members are entitled to do. But I would advise the House that over 60 members signed this petition. Virtually every element of the elected representatives in this House have signed the motion, which indicates they support it which indicates that almost the entire Assembly supports the content of this motion. So I would appeal to members from this point in time to watch their language, measure their language, and be respectful of, of all sides, and bear in mind this, that you are demonstrating your leadership, or lack of it, as the case may be, to the general public, who I believe are looking in on this debate this morning, probably in big numbers. So please show what this House can do can achieve when it works together, which is what the sentiments have been of the vast majority of the speakers who have contributed here this morning. So I want to end on that remark, but I say I want to appeal to members to measure their language, be respectful, and make sure that you give a positive demonstration of leadership to the wider community who are looking in here, hopefully looking for hope and inspiration that we're moving forward into a better place than moving back 20 years as we have done this past week in our community. On that basis, then, I want to recall Mr. Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And wherever any call comes from violence, it is wrong. I want to return to the issue of rhetoric. The Alliance leader was on the radio this morning, and she rightly said that our language, uh, we need to consider our language. She then went on to say that we had been lied to about Brexit. I have to say, if, if the starting point for us today, as we leave this chamber, is to take the advice of the Speaker 
and the comments of some that we have already spoken is to mind our language, then let us be consistent in that. I said this morning, I have suffered politically and personally because in 2007 we came into government with Sinn Féin. People have stopped speaking to me. People have stopped socialising with us. All of that. We have stretched out the hand to those who were, time is up. who were justifying murder and mayhem. Now the time has come to show respect. Show respect not only by your words, but by your deeds. And do what you say others should do. And dial down the rhetoric and give leadership to your own community as well as respect to mine. I call Derry Hargate. Thanks very much, and I rise to support the motion. And I do hope that this House today stands united in our unequivocal condemnation of the violence that has ensued over the last week. Violence that has seen petrol bombs, public transport worker forced from their bus, and the bus burnt, photographer attacked and injured, residents and communities living in fear, young people being used by sinister adults to attack the police, sinister elements placing petrol bombs in the hands of young people, those same sinister elements who place drugs in the hands of young people and criminal elements who are using our children. And I'm deeply concerned that the protests are being organised at interface areas. These protests are being widely circulated on social media. And I've worked on interface issues for over 20 years in Belfast. And my experience tells me that those who organise on or near interface areas are not intent on peaceful protest. Their intent is organised and is a deliberate attempt to stoke up violence and sectarianism, and that's what we've seen last night. We must stand together collectively and condemn this violence. We must stand together and condemn those criminal and sinister elements who are using young people to incite violence. We can see on a daily basis, even this morning, orchestrated attempts to organise more protests and again at or near uh, fl interface flashpoints. These criminal gangs have nothing to offer the community. They should disband, they should climb off the backs of their community. Street po protests need to be called off, and as it's clear they're leading to tension and violence. And I hope this House unites around these issues. I want to take the opportunity to commend the many community and youth leaders and activists who have been tirelessly on the ground engaging with young people and trying to pull them away from the violence. I live in a community just like those young people caught up in the violence at Sandy Row, which is in my own constituency, and also on the Shankill Road, working class communities. We have similar housing. We suffer from poverty. We have the same health inequalities that see people in our communities die younger than the average by almost 10 years because of the links of poverty. Communities facing the pressure of development without their interests being considered. High levels of unemployment. Communities that have borne the brunt of conflict. Communities that have borne the brunt of sectarianism. Communities who bear the brunt of health and economic shocks. Communities that I've been a youth worker, a community activist, elected rep and also a resident, who need cross-party support from this chamber, from the executive and from the assembly to tackle poverty and inequality, to target resources on the basis of objective need, targeting those communities like Sandy Row, like the Shankill Road, the Springfield Road, the Waterside and the Bogside. And I will work with all around the executive table and across this chamber to achieve that. Now is the time for calm, to call for an end to violent protests and for criminal gangs to go away. Leave the communities alone. Get off the backs of our young people and the backs of our communities. And to our young people and our communities, I want to work with you. I want to hear your voices and ensure that they are heard. I want to listen to you. I am here to engage and to work with you to address the issues and the hopes for our communities. So let's stamp out the flames of hate and work to allow our young people and our communities to flourish. Gormila Mayogat. Gormila thank you. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
23 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, this is the right moment to reflect on its success and, yes, on where it has been less than successful. It gave us peace, but it has not given us reconciliation. And perhaps just as bad, it has failed to get rid of paramilitaries and the sinister forces within our communities. The people of Northern Ireland are deeply frustrated. They're depressed and they're disappointed in our politics and in our politicians. Every single MLA in this House has been told at one time or another that they feel their constituents have been let down. Our politicians are not living up to the vision, the spirit and the hope contained within the Good Friday Agreement. When it comes to governing Northern Ireland, the political tension between the DUP and Sinn Féin is palpable. And when it comes to big decisions, issues that need resolved, like Brexit, like COVID, like schools opening, like schools closing, like victims' pensions, like the provisions of women's health service, there is rarely a meeting of minds, and the dirty linen tends to be washed in public. A sectarian mindset still prevails. There is no disguising that we have had our fill of serious pressures in our political institutions. We can all accept that Brexit has regrettably reopened old wounds and indeed sharpened all the lines and divisions that the Good Friday Agreement sought to soften around sovereignty, identity and borders. The SDLP hears and deeply regrets the feelings and frustrations of abandonment that is acutely felt within our unionist community. As a nationalist, I truly understand this. However, John Hume once said, if you fall into reacting to reaction, you lose perspective and judgment. And I am afraid that this is precisely what has happened. And the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister should reflect very carefully on the role that they each have played. The outworking of political ineptitude creates a space for violence in our streets. Political dissension provided a target and an opportunity for disorder. In the past day, nine days in Derry and Belfast and other parts of Northern Ireland, we have seen 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds on the streets throwing petrol bombs, stones, rocks and setting cars alight. They were not there to demand that the protocol be scrapped or that Simon Byrne resign from the PSNI. We can be confident that these teenagers were motivated and manipulated by paramilitary groups. In the Waterside area of Derry, that means the UDA. And we know that the PSNI has been ramping up its actions against the DU or UDA in recent weeks. No wonder its leaders are causing a ruckus. Because whatever the UDA claims to be, it's actually just a criminal operation that sells drugs, runs protection rackets, and engages in loan sharking. Its members become rich, while its victims become poor. Note that the UDA is unique. In Derry, there is a drugs war between the INLA and the new IRA, which has led to recent shootings. We have to do so much more to rid ourselves of the scourge of these paramilitaries. The last thing we need to do is give these sinister forces any type of political cover or any type of credibility. The First Minister surely must understand that this would just be a reckless action. These are groups that do not want to move on because their members do very well, thank you, from holding us back. We must give our young people hope in the future, whereas the paramilitaries offer them a few minutes of buzz, followed by years of deprivation, and for some, a criminal record or prison. Leadership is what can take us out of this mess. We need to put an end to the zero-sum politics that prevails among us. We need to give our young people hope for a better future, we need to create a more equal and just society. We need to move beyond segregated communities. We need to create good jobs. And we need to ensure that people in our poorest communities benefit from those opportunities. 
Unemployment and deprivation are the recruitment agents for paramilitaries. Time's up. So let's take the oxygen away from them and invest in a good education system where we support our young people into a better life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Meg Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I speak as a member of this Assembly and of the Policing Board. Um, I was on a Zoom last night with some concerned, very concerned citizens, uh, one of whom made the point that, as politicians, we are not consistent in what we say and in how we say it. Rather, we shape our words to our audience and to the forum in which we speak. And isn't there truth in that? And another asked this, when we're in dialogue here, is it civil, constructive, humble, and charitable? And he wasn't joking. And it reminds me of the Thursdays at Ulster Television when I chaired political debates. And politicians had no difficulty tearing verbal lumps out of each other on live television. But come the green room afterwards, how different was it? Over a tea, a wine, a beer? Did your mum get her hip operation yet? Did your son get his grades for university? There were relationships. Where have those relationships gone? And if there is an opportunity in this crisis, Mr. Speaker, is it not to renew our pledge of support for this agreement, which will be 23 this weekend, to build new relationships based on mutual respect and trust building? I heard my friend Doug Beattie on the radio this morning with my friend Matthew O'Toole. And I was very struck when Doug said he wanted to stand shoulder to shoulder with Matthew, not just to condemn the violence, but to build a better society. I'd like to stand shoulder to shoulder with every member, every single member of this assembly, to do just that. But I'm held back by one party who are making it very difficult, and it's the Republican Party opposite, because they will not apologize for something they should not have done. And that does not excuse the violence because nothing, nothing excuses that violence. So we come, Mr. Speaker, uh, to what I've described previously as events which can be explained but cannot be excused. And I think we should look for explanations for why this violence is occurring. And I've heard, I've heard many reasons. The funeral, the protocol, two-tier policing, the statement by the public prosecutor, a reaction to the success of the police and the National Crime Agency against some of these organized criminal gangs. And by the way, can we stop calling them paramilitary groups, please? That may describe how they're organized, but it doesn't reflect their intent. Their intent is to terrorize people, to exercise coercive control on communities, up to and including child abuse, to intimidate and to extort. So let's think about better language to describe these groups. But there is another reason that I've heard to explain the violence, which cannot be excused. And that is a sense of alienation in the communities where the violence is taking place. And so I have to ask the parties who brought us programs such as the Social Investment Fund and TBUC, together building a united community, can you, in a civil, constructive, humble, and charitable way, say there has been a failure? And then can we come together as an assembly and as a coalition government and fix it? Because if you look at the league tables of areas of deprivation and you go back 10 and 20 years, the top 10 are still the top 10. So whatever we have done has failed to solve the problem. Gavin Way, and I think he's made a very powerful point. And I think when I was Minister in Social Development, I remember asking for a breakdown of all the money spent in certain areas. And it was stark that money was spent in the very areas that we are seeing today that are engulfed in violence and trouble. And I do wonder, is it because there has been the tendency to feed some other than others and give priority to some other people in those communities. And maybe that's part of the problem as well. Member has an extra minute. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank Mr. Story for his intervention. All I, all I would say to him is, if he studies my remarks over the years about the Social Investment Fund, he will understand that I was no fan uh, of that program. But let us look forward, uh, because there's still opportunity here to address those issues. We are, after all, a coalition government of five parties. So that means to me we should be a government for all, not for sections, not for factions, but a government for all our people. And I can think of no better way to close, Mr. Speaker, than to quote from the agreement, which is 23 years old this Saturday. The Declaration of Support, paragraph three. We are committed to partnership, equality, and mutual respect as the basis of relationships. It's time, Mr. Speaker, it's well past time that we delivered. I call Joanne Bunting. Mr. Speaker, I declare my membership of the Policing Board. I deplore violence, all violence, regardless of the source. I'm appalled at what we've witnessed. I'm sorry for the public and the police who were injured, and I'm horrified that these children be criminalised. But it's so disappointing to me that civic society is quick to condemn, but doesn't seem to want to understand, never mind address, what's at the root of this. We're always analysing those who commit crime, what was in their background, what gave them the propensity, broken families, drug abuse, legacy of the troubles, violence in the home. But we should also want to understand why there's ratting and civil unrest now. We also need to look and consider how did we get here? What brought them to this and what needs to change? There is massive political and cultural alienation. I'm not condoning or justifying their behaviour because it's never acceptable to burn a bus or throw a petrol bomb or attack a police officer. But part of this is that they have watched and learned that violence or the threat of it has often paid off, sometimes literally, with funding. Historically, they've watched parades rerouted or stopped because of violent protest and fear of disorder. And more recently, they've watched the law blatantly broken by those who wrote it without consequence. The political elite in Sinn Féin, who adopt a do-as-we-say, not-as-we-do attitude and bring thousands onto the streets and hundreds into a cemetery when every other family got 25 or 30 or 10 and weren't allowed into the crematorium, never mind what is viewed as being given control of it. Sinn Féin, happy to write and endorse draconian laws for restrictions, safe in the knowledge that they can flout them without recourse. Those laws may be for everybody else, but there's another set of rules for Sinn Féin, for they appear to be above the law. They also appear to be facilitated by the police to breach these laws in ways that are inexplicable and unacceptable. I want to place on record my full support for the rank and file police officers who are having to deal with this on the ground. But something needs to change at the top, and at the very least, it's the mentality. The story funeral was the benchmark to which the placing of all other restrictions is compared. There absolutely is two-tier policing in Northern Ireland, and the PPS provided the evidence last week. In any circumstance, where the PPS writes that the PSNI's behaviour had anything to do with them being unable to bring a, a prosecution. That's a massive problem and an epic failure on behalf of the PSNI. I've been harping, and that's the only word for it, that the, at the policing board about two-tier policing since I got there in 2016. I've raised my community's lack of confidence in the police at pretty much every meeting, private and public. But until recently, I was dismissed like a child because the police didn't believe that I was right and they didn't care if they were wrong. We're all supposed to be equal under the law and equally subject to it. 
But that's not the case, and everybody in my community sees it. And that's why all four unionist parties have indicated they no longer have confidence in the Chief Constable and some of his team, nor do the people we represent. That should matter. Another example, recruitment. There are five underrepresented groups in the police, but there are only four who have support groups set up in the organisation. There are only four with whom the police and policing board proactively engage. And when the police advertise, only four are mentioned in the ad. One isn't. And the one exception is always working class Protestants. Our community's had enough, and so have we. Some, or some of them express their anger and frustration in the right way. Absolutely not. But that does not invalidate their fears and views. They are shared by hundreds of thousands of people who do not take to the streets. They're, I will. Can I thank the member for giving away, and maybe just because you would followed on from uh, Mr Nesbitt in terms of what he said and others have said today in relation to maybe not getting into the detail, albeit we are here today to, talk, to try and calm down the rhetoric, but I think you will maybe accept in terms of your contribution and in terms of what Mike Nesbitt has said that there maybe is an opportunity after this debate to actually get into those issues and find actually what the core problems is in all of those areas. I thank the member. I agree, and I think we will. But their behaviour is not that of the outlier. Sorry, their behaviour is that of the outlier, but their views are not. Their frustrations are mainstream, and they're also ours. You see, two things can be true at once. It is entirely possible to condemn the violence and yet still be frustrated at the annexing of Northern Ireland through the protocol, believing this is not the Brexit for which you voted. You can still condemn the violence and be aghast at a weak PPS who tells you not to believe your own eyes. There's nothing to see here. It's the laws. They're very confusing. It is entirely possible to condemn the violence and still be angry that there is two-tier policing. Protestant, Unionist and Loyalist, and I am all of those, no longer feel like they're heard, listened to or valued Members, time's up. in what is supposed to be a shared society. Thank you. And I call Terry Kelly. Gormogat Kian Kolya, I rise to support the motion and uh, I thank Naomi Long for bringing that motion forward at this, uh, at this particular time. Uh, it's important with the, the last week of violence and destruction that we get unanimous agreement uh, to the motion and I'm glad to hear that the executive has put out a statement although I haven't as yet seen it. The immediate message, of course, is that the violence needs to stop and it needs to stop now. One voice on this issue, whatever the disagreement on other issues. When I started to write these notes, there were over 40 police officers injured, and we now know that there's uh, up to 55, and I would like to join with others in the chamber to wish them a, a speedy recovery. And of course, as other members have mentioned, there were uh, civilians uh, who get uh, damaged with all this, uh, all this violence as well. Uh, last night there was mayhem at what should have been an historic uh, interface in Belfast. And I'm calling it historic because it should have been a thing of the past that maybe tourists go and look at or whatever, anybody with interest. I then spent hours at Lanark Way engaging with the police and others on the ground trying to de-escalate the confrontations, along, as I said, with many others. And that is what we as politicians need to do here, to de-escalate the rhetoric and show leadership. And a good place to start is not with what about it, although that may be too late, but with having a realistic view of the uh, situation. These are crime gangs, crime gangs who are orchestrating the violence for their own ends. There can be no justification for the violence, so let us accept no pseudo rationale uh, for it. We must collectively challenge and face down those who are handing stones and battles and fireworks and petrol bombs into children's hands. Our experience in Dirty Hargy mentioned this, I have a similar experience to her, is that the intent of, if there are those who are intent on escalation of unrest, they always move that unrest near to the interfaces and try and turn that into a tit for tat uh, uh, situation. In fact, I made that very point at a meeting a couple of days ago with the Chief Constable at the Policing Board. I should have declared earlier that I'm a member of the Policing Board. Unfortunately, I then witnessed it in West and North Belfast because it did spread throughout last night. Uh, we, should, uh, we must call out threats of sectarian attacks on elected representatives, on journalists, and on ordinary people in their workplaces and homes. 
paramilitary drug dealers cannot be allowed, cannot be allowed to uh, work as community workers by day and thugs by night. They do not represent loyalism or any other section of society. So let's not join in the pretense that they speak for anyone but themselves. Whatever our criticism or disagreement with senior police officers, demanding their removal does not solve the problem. There are accountability mechanisms set up to deal with complaints, big and small. And the place to deal with political disagreements is here, in this chamber, not by refusing to meet, but by dialogue and outreach, by listening and finding answers collectively when that is possible. Sinn Féin will always work to resolve difficult problems when possible, and that can only be done with other parties. Um, today, sorry, today, the motion speaks for itself, so let's condemn violence without equivocation, wherever it occurs, and uphold a culture of lawfulness in both actions and words. Last night, uh, we got a report this morning that uh, a number of plastic bullets, or AEPs, uh, were fired for the first time in many years. And that, to me, shows the tinderbox that we are in at this moment. And no one wants to go back to those days. So I urge those organizing these protests, because by bringing people onto the street, this is going to escalate, to stop before someone is killed. Tommy Tackle, Lesh and Ray. Go on over. May I call Kelly Armstrong? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'll not take up too much time. Um, folks, I grew up in the, the Troubles, and I just wanted to take you back to the realism of, of what is happening over the last few days. Um, I watched on video last night um, two women. One stood at the side of the road clapping while a, a group of people wearing masks and dark clothes ran down the road. And the other one was a health worker who was trying to get her car out before the burning bus blocked her in. Why have we come to this situation? Why have we two people who live in the same area, work in the same area, with such different attitudes? And this comes back to our failure and delivering a shared society. It has been mentioned before. We've had TBUC, we've had all of the shared housing, we've had this stuff. Why hasn't it worked? It hasn't worked because I don't believe that this place has committed to it. Today, all parties need, not have to, but need to condemn the violence. We need to reaffirm our support for the police and the rule of law. We do not need to add to the police's pressures at this time by undermining their leadership. This is an opportunity for parties to work together. When this recall petition came forward, a lot of people said to me, sure, this is a talking shop. It means nothing. There'll be no action out of it. Can we leave today with action? It has been talked about by Mr Clark. I welcome the opportunity to sit down and find out exactly what the issues are. There are lots of issues out there. We all know that. But it's time we in this place took leadership and brought it forward. Not just at the moment. I want to rebuild trust. I want to bring forward political solutions. We know that political solutions can work. They worked in the past. I don't want to have my child sitting watching the news with petrol bombs being thrown at people. That's attempted murder. It's time we stop this carry on. I am aware, thankfully, that parties are meeting with the Chief Constable. I am aware that the Policing Board has been meeting with the police. These are all the actions that the public need to hear from us. The public also need to hear from us that we need to use language, not to heighten tensions and to cause more problems and to give people cover for criminal activities, but to bring our community together. I certainly give way, Mr Stoy. Oh, forgiving way. Um, um, can I make this plea to you and to colleagues around this House? When some of us come to this House with genuine concerns about problems, things that we will disagree on. I'm not going to start listing them, because that's not for today. But that we are not dismissed, that we are not seen as dinosaurs, but we are genuinely representing people in our community who hold those views, and we're not dismissed. If today can achieve anything, surely the start of actually putting into action that respect will be a step forward. Thank you, Mr. Story, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, what I can say is I don't consider Northern Ireland to have two communities. I'm part of one community. So issues for anybody is issues for all of us. 
I absolutely agree with you. But can I just say, can we knock on the head this crack about two-tier policing? I appreciate you have concerns about the police force, but this is the same police force that has had 55 officers hurt, and probably that number will increase. These are people who are trying to protect us. These are people who helped to get that health worker and her car out so she could go on about her business. And at a time of a health pandemic, we need our health workers. We need our police. There are young people out there. And Mr Middleton, you said about we can improve choices. We can improve choices by not using contentious language as politicians. That contentious language does give criminals the excuse they need to harm our community, and they are harming it. I'm aware at this moment, while we're here, there's a protest outside City Hall of bus drivers terrified to go to work because one of their colleagues was petrol bombed. We need to support our community, our whole community together. And I welcome the opportunity to sit down with every one of you. And as Mr Nesbitt says outside this room, I can sit with a cup of tea with any of you in taking something proactive forward. It's our time to move this away from the troubles, not back into it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, when I read this motion, I, I have no difficulty supporting the motion in terms of condemning violence. Um, I have never supported violence. Um, what I would want to say is probably already been said by many members but I want to pick up something on the last speaker in terms of us changing our rhetoric about the two-tier policing. It's more than members on the union benches are saying that. It's actually members of the police saying that themselves. So this is not us saying this. This is the that possibly could be even one of the 55 officers who have been injured. And, and my thoughts do go to each and every one of those. But those men and women are put out to do a job. And not every one of them agree with what they're being asked to do. And they also have the perception that the, their job is a two-tier police force. Now, for that reason, I think it's difficult for us to support the leadership of the police until that perception is changed. It's already been touched today. I will not say It's already been touched today in terms of the funeral. And it's terrible we have to continue to rehearse the funeral. But the PPS's answer says it all. I think it was my colleague Joanne Bunting read it out in relation to that. And there's no other way to suggest other than the fact that the PSNA facilitated that funeral. I, I'll, I'll give away in a second. No other way to read it other than they facilitated the funeral. I mean, and, and I mean, sorry, I should have declared it now. I'm a member of the policing board. I raised with the chief constable last week. The, 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 the police had the plan for the funeral. Thirty people to attend the funeral. Space provision made for another 94 people to participate. That is an absolute contrast to where the rules were. So they broke the rules. They facilitated Sinn Féin to break the rules. I'll give way to yourself. Member for giving way, and I thank the member um, for pointing out that there are issues. What I would say is we have mechanisms that are in place. I would prefer we use those mechanisms, allow those to take place, because we, we all agree here in supporting the police and following the rule of law. And part of that law is our mechanisms in place. If the mechanisms are not right, then the policing board and others have the opportunity to amend those. But the mechanisms must be key, not the media. I agree. I mean, we're waiting on two things. And, and it's right, the board did unanimously agree to the HMIC report. I support that. I'm looking forward to the outcome of that. Also, some members privately wrote to the Ombudsman for an investigation for the Ombudsman. I'm also looking forward to that. Those things, I think, will bring answers. Now, I, I'm listening to what the Speaker has said, and I, I want to try and keep the tone right, because I want to see an end to the violence. I, I will not say. I, I want to see an end to the violence because it serves no good for no one, other than actually giving people criminal records. So I, I want to get to a place. But I think one of those ways, and I think Mr Story touched on it, members right across this chamber need to listen to genuine concerns that we bring because we speak to people, we listen to people, and those are genuine concerns. And you must listen to those. I will. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. The member knows that I come from a working class background and I live in a working class housing estate. The member agree with me that it is absolutely essential that we send a powerful message to our young people that the way to effect change in your community is to get politically involved and active. 
and only to go through, down the democratic routes that are available because the other routes will lead to ruin. Absolutely, I, I concur with that. And I mean, I put on record myself, I grew up in a working class uh, estate as well. And I'm, I say to many people, and I may have not lived in that area now, but I say to many people, I, would think, I wouldn't think twice to have to go back. It wouldn't cost me a, a shadow, it wouldn't cost me a problem to go back because I enjoyed my time there. But what I really deplore is seeing our people, people I grew up with, getting themselves criminal records for no reason. So it is, we do need to dial down the rhetoric, but we also need to get to the solutions and fix the problems, change the perceptions and give people hope. Because as, as Naomi did say, or the minister did say at the outset in her contribution, about there is a list of things that we could pinpoint as reasons. But we can't dismiss those reasons. We, no, 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 sorry, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying the minister did say we're dismissing those. I'm saying, but we can't dismiss those. We can, we can dial down the rhetoric today, we can calm things down, but we must go back and look at every one of those issues and look at them with an open mind and trying to get a resolution to bring as many people as possible with us. We will never satisfy, satisfy everyone, but there is real palpable anger out there today. And I agree, it could be any one of those. It may not be one issue, but it's a multiple, multiple number of issues. And I think the sooner we get to the position to dial down to that and find out what those were and try and address those, rather than dismissing people and people's genuine concerns. Members, I have five further speakers um, before we have the wind, and I'm prepared to give each of the five speakers two minutes to make sure all speakers get in. But it has to be two minutes, and I will ask you to sit down if you extend beyond the two minutes. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I'll be brief. I simply want to add my voice to those of my um, party colleagues, Nicola Mallon and Sinead McLaughlin, in condemning utterly the um, uh, scenes that we've seen uh, supporting the motion uh, that um, Naomi Long uh, and other colleagues have brought to the Assembly um, today. Um, it's been fairly traumatic uh, for people across the society to look at images on their uh, screens over the last few nights of uh, things that people had genuinely thought were part of our past here. But unfortunately, there are people in this society who seem intent on inflicting the past uh, on our children and making children, some of whom were not even born when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, uh, carry forward a legacy of hatred and division. Um, those children are being uh, handed petrol bombs by criminal gangs, uh, so we cannot uh, tolerate that, we can't condone it, and we can't, um, we can't let it stand. I'm glad to see today widespread condemnation. I hope that will continue, and I hope we can all find ways to uh, both moderate our language but to come together. I think it's worth import importantly saying, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I will be brief, these are working class communities. There's a deep and profound alienation that's happening in these areas. They're loyalist areas and people care about their identity. I respect and understand that people can have legitimate concerns about the outworkings of Brexit and their sense that, uh, that they're frustrated about new trading arrangements. I get that. I'm not deaf to it, I'm not blind to it, and I don't seek to demean it. But this isn't a tolerable or uh, justifiable response in any way. Nor can we as elected officials communicate to people that in a society like this one that we can get everything that we want. We have to share this space. The outworkings of Brexit are difficult, Members they're complicated, up. and the only way we can get through them is if we accept that we are a shared space. Members, shared time community. is up. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Speaker. I call Christopher Salford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, like the mover of the motion and like my colleague from uh, South Belfast, Deidre Hargy, I am proud to come from a working class background. And it's devastating and heartbreaking to see violence on the streets of working class communities, some of which I have the great privilege and honour to represent. My message to the young people who are engaging in this reckless and criminal behaviour is to stop. It will achieve nothing, it will advance no cause, and at the end of it, there's a genuine possibility that you will destroy your life forever by landing yourself with a criminal record. You're also destroying public services in their own communities. When buses are attacked, and we say, we've already had reference to the fact that we have a situation now where transport workers are afraid to go to their place of work. That's, that's hurting the wider community, and it's not acceptable. There is an alternative to 
behaviour like this, and I said earlier in the debate, and that is to get politically active, to get involved in your local community. If you want to affect change, you can be part of positive change by involving yourself in your local community group, or joining a, a political party, running for the council, make a contribution in that way through democratic uh, means. I have four young children, sir, and I want them to grow up in a better society than that which I grew up in or that, that which my mother's generation grew up in at the height of the Troubles. We have a responsibility to point a way to our young people, all of our young people, because they deserve better than that which we had growing up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Roy Beggs. I do rise to support the motion. Uh, at the same as the shock and concern at the level of violence that we saw once more on our streets. Every petrol bomb that was thrown, every piece of masonry that was thrown could have resulted in serious injury or death, whether that's a member of the public or a member of our police service. I think in particular we have to thank the PSNI for their actions in Lanark Way in keeping that gate closed, because undoubtedly if the two groups of rioters, rioters were able to get direct conflict with each other, there may well have been a loss of life. So we must thank the police for what they did in that particular instance. Turning to my East Antrim constituency, um, there was dreadful rioting occurring at, at Clock Mills and reports that the South East Antrim UDA invited businesses to close because there was going to be a riot. Um, young people, teenagers were largely at the front line. Um, some obviously had nothing to lose. That's an issue that we must address. Uh, we must ensure that there's a place for everyone in our community and that no one is left, left behind. Again, there was a wheelie bin set in far uh, in the North Road in Carrick Fergus, and police were also attacked. Violence must stop. Thankfully, at that evil roundabout in Larn, uh, largely peaceful protests, but politics must be seen to work, and that is a challenge to us all. We have genuine concerns about the Northern Ireland Protocol. The community has. This is not just politicians. Anybody ordering items on the internet will find that out. And there is concerns with our criminal justice system. Thankfully, we have a, a review of the PPS decision and an independent review of policing. Hopefully, lessons will be learned. And the politicians also need lessons that they do what they say, that they lead by example. Now, the lessons up. must be learned from what happened at the Bobby Story funeral so that others do not feel incensed. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, violence on our streets is depressingly familiar. We've seen this all before. And my message today is stop it. It's not worth it. Conflict and disorder form part of a peace settlement for Northern Ireland, which is supposedly a beacon of hope for conflicts around the world. Incredibly, I studied this at university as a model of conflict transformation. The reality differs considerably much to the myth, though. We know that this has been a political process rather than a peace process. Everything has changed, yet nothing has changed. Criminal gangs still coerce communities, and we live segregated and divided lives, both physically and psychologically. We continue to divide between us and them, and words and narratives used to divide when it suits and continued failure of elected politicians here. Not all of those engaging in violence recently are or were young people, so let's not forget that. But those who are becoming sucked into or encouraged into violence and conflict that does not belong to them are certainly not expressing anger like this because of a protocol or a political fallout over regulations. What about those that are 13 years old now in the process of getting a criminal record and all that have gone before? Shall we arrest them, charge them and let the justice system de deal with it as bickering and fighting continues in this chamber across society and as legitimate concerns and grievances in communities are still ignored? Do we continue to cut corners, cut investment and opportunities, leave people to fend for themselves and get exploited or be directed into public disorder and criminality? Where is the responsibility, Mr Speaker? What we deserve and we need is strong, mature leadership from this executive, and this has been lacking. It has been lacking since 1998. We have had a political agreement, but not a peace agreement. People have been left behind and continue to do so. It is not good enough, Mr Speaker, and we need to replace hostility with hope. 
Thank you. And I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. As we've heard, uh, as this meeting uh, started, bus workers have walked out uh, in Belfast against sectarianism and violence and intimidation, and we have to send our solidarity uh, to them today and going forward. And I think the trade union movement will be incredibly crucial in the period going ahead. I also want to send my solidarity to the bus driver and the passengers of the hijacked bus yesterday and extend my sympathies and best wishes to Kevin Scott, a journalist uh, b- attacked brutally yesterday, and no worker uh, should be subject uh, to that kind of activity, um, providing a public service in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, last night, Mr Speaker, I was at Lanark Way, an interface in West Belfast, that witnessed crowds on either side gathering with petrol bombs flying over the so-called Peace Wall. Some of us were there to appeal for calm, uh, for people to desist from the rioting last night. And I want to say fair play to all those who uh, gathered, the community workers, the youth workers who were out last night, doing their best to appeal for calm. And today, just like last night, I stand with those families in interface areas who are once again living in fear, who have had their cars stolen, their areas petrol bombed, uh, and, and much trouble uh, on top of that. Uh, and no doubt, Mr. Speaker, uh, everybody in here today condemns the violence, uh, as do I. But I'm afraid that's where the cohesion uh, has to end on my part, and I have limited time to explain this, uh, unfortunately, today, uh, in terms of providing support for the motion, because I do not believe that it does provide an alternative message to the same old politics which have fostered division across working class communities across our uh, society, and which enables sectarian tensions to grow. And for this reason, I try to submit an, an amendment. And we hear talk about a law and order response from some today with no sense of irony uh, or hypocrisy when some of those parties and ministers cozied up the paramilitaries who, by definition, are not upholders of the law and who have engaged in organising people out on the streets in the last week uh, to wreak havoc. Moreover, Mr Speaker, it is hypocritical for some within the executive to now condemn the same paramilitary Mm. groups they have funded, uh, catered to and legitimised for so long, the same groups who act as gatekeepers to funding and continue to exert control over working class communities. I would like to say much more, but unfortunately I have no time left. Thank you. Thank you. And all members would always want to say more, and that's the, that would be their right, but not always appropriate at the time. So thank you for that. Thank all the members for their contributions. And I call uh, Stuart Dixon to wind on the motion. The members have 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, and indeed, it does fall to me uh, to wind on the motion and the debate that we've had in this chamber today. And I trust that not all of the words that I'm about to uh, give to this assembly today will indeed fall, hopefully not entirely, on deaf ears. I wish to thank uh, Naomi Long as leader of the Alliance Party for for bringing this motion today and to thank this House and you, Mr Speaker, uh, to allow the proposal to recall the Assembly. Today, Mr Speaker, is a day for leadership, to show our commitment to the police service of Northern Ireland, to show our commitment to the rule of law and to unite against all violence and lawlessness in our society. Put simply, Mr Speaker, This must stop. Some 19 members of this chamber have been able to speak today, and they indeed have put on record their views on this motion. I don't need to further amplify uh, what they have said, but I do wish to place on record my uh, thanks to the executive this morning uh, who have met and to uh, welcome the joint statement uh, that has been given by the First and Def- Deputy First Minister and on behalf of the Executive of the Northern Ireland Assembly in relation to the issues that have been ongoing for some time. Mr Speaker, the violence on our streets over the past weeks is wrong. Some of it has been opportunistic and it serves only to undermine the communities in which the destruction has taken place. That includes communities in my own constituency of East Antrim, where regrettably we have seen attacks on police and on property. Police officers undertaking their duty to protect everyone have been attacked and injured. People have had cars stolen and destroyed. Public property has been damaged, and indeed those perpetrating the violence have been injured themselves, and rightfully there have been arrests. I am, like everyone in this chamber, deeply concerned that there also appear to be young children brought into these protests. Indeed, I observed that when some young children were blocking traffic in Larne on Tuesday night. Members have made reference to the need to tackle the structural inadequacies here in Northern Ireland. 
That is evidently clear when you see what has gone on on the streets over the last number of nights. We need to build trust and confidence in this society and in these communities, in all communities across Northern Ireland. And that can only be done when we listen to everyone in this chamber. Yes, we must listen to the voices, every one of the voices that have spoken up in this chamber today. The violence, some have said, is orchestrated in many cases by sinister criminal elements, and that indeed may be true. However, uh, those encouraged onto the streets are often, often vulnerable young people and children, risking their futures and their safety, and indeed, sadly, uh, in the past, they have also risked lives. I want to say to those young people, I don't know whether any of them will ever listen to me, to think twice before they're getting involved in this criminality. I appeal to mums and dads, indeed to anyone of good influence, to speak up in extremely dangerous. You are destroying your own local community. You're hurting your friends and your family. And your future prospects will be on the line if you end up with a criminal record. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, I am encouraged, indeed strongly encouraged, by the resounding rejection of this violence in social media by people in many communities. It's not wanted. What is wanted, however, are peaceful political solutions to problems, solutions that this House must commit to. Regardless of the breadth of voices that have been expressed in this chamber today, the one message that I have heard coming through is a desire to sit down and talk and start to work out what those peaceful solutions are. As elected representatives, it is our job to lead and to set by example. So I am disappointed that the examples that have been set in recent weeks. Violence is completely unacceptable and counterproductive. And we have to acknowledge the words and actions of political representatives do have consequences. As has been expressed by many in this chamber, there was no excuse for the actions of Sinn Féin, including our Deputy First Minister, amongst others, in undermining the COVID restrictions at the funeral of Bobby Storey last year. No excuses. The Deputy First Minister has much work to do to restore any public confidence following this. I don't believe the immensity of that task has actually struck home entirely yet, but I do hope that her words today were a step forward. The people of Northern Ireland are understandably upset at the hypocrisy of delivering decisions on regulations that impact lives hugely, and yet attending such a large event in the midst of severe restrictions. I share the, fear, the, the feelings and frustrations of the community when they see that. However, other parties, the DUP and Ulster Unionist Party's response to the PPS announcement not to pursue any prosecution was also not constructive. The DUP and the Ulster Unionist Party must also understand that we have to end this two-faced approach to supporting PSNI officers, but not their leadership. That is deeply undermining, and it has in fact put rank-and-file officers at risk. Rank-and-file officers look to their leadership for direction, and the opportunistic politicisation of the PSNI leadership by the DUP and the UUP is unacceptable and profoundly counterproductive. Our First Minister needs to show leadership and to meet the Chief Constable, and I'm pleased that that is likely to happen. Discussion about concerns rather than the pursuit of politicising our police, because, simply put, it's what's expected of a First Minister. Undermining confidence in the leadership of the PSNI at such a sensitive time is clearly unhelpful, and sadly we've seen the outworking of that on our streets. And I hope the First Minister's words today will be seen as a step forward as well, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to express my and my party's unequivocal support for the PSNI for the work that they do in extremely challenging circumstances. In addition to uh, sending our best wishes to those who are injured and sympathy for the members of the public who have faced distress while their, public, while their property and communities have been damaged and indeed to the bus drivers, it is simply unacceptable. It has to stop now. Finally, Mr. Speaker, the protocol has been mentioned here today as well. The DUP's attempt to deflect on this matter simply isn't working. No one wanted the protocol, but it was the consequence to the hard Brexit that was championed by that party. 
against the political and economic and social interests of Northern Ireland. The reality is that we have the protocol because that party sank the backstop, which would have seen no customs border throughout the whole of the UK or Ireland. It's time to wake up to the Brexit reality. It's time to stop and let us move to a light touch on Brexit instead of lighting the blue touch paper on every occasion. I want to finish. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I call on everyone in this chamber to work to, ref to defuse uh, the frictions, to stop boycotts, to stop deflection, to stop whipping up tension, and to do what we've been saying here today, to get round the table and to sit down and work out how we can approach the UK government together, collectively, to try and resolve and mitigate many of these issues. Mr. Speaker, in closing, the message from today is simply one, that the violence must stop. No one should be above the COVID restrictions or the law in general. And we, as political representatives, have to set an example. So I do invite members to join with my party today to demonstrate our united condemnation of the violence and to demonstrate a full and unreserved support of the PSNI and of the communities that have been harmed by violence. That's the PSNI, Mr Speaker, from the Chief Constable down through every single rank. There is no two-tiered policing and no room for it in Northern Ireland. It is incumbent upon all of us to show leadership, to dial down the rhetoric and to seek solutions. We must all accept and apologise, and I include myself, for where we are wrong. Our words and our actions have consequences especially when we are in positions of leadership. Mr Speaker, let us go from this place today determined to address all and every one of the issues raised by members around this chamber. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. I can't be no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I'd like to thank all the members for their contributions this morning. And I would also like to thank the officials in the Speaker's Office and the Business Office for working with the parties over the last number of days throughout their holiday leave period um, to make this debate happen today. So thank you all. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. <laughs>